This morning, the title for my uh, sermon is, Is It Too Late? The reason I don't have a PowerPoint is because we are going to be in uh, the chapter 6 of Hebrews. So turn your Bibles to chapter 6 of Hebrews. Uh, Paul is believed to be the writer of Hebrews, so when I, when I use the phrase, uh, the Hebrew writer, I'm referring to Paul. So, uh, it's not too late. Is it too late? Another way of saying it is you still have a chance, an opportunity, or there's still hope. Most of the time, uh, these are some pretty encouraging words of comfort and relief, but uh, sometimes it has nothing to do with religion at all or going to heaven or anything like that. You might be rushing to a store and trying to get there before they close and you get inside or you go to a restaurant and go in and get inside uh, before everything's and you always say am I too late did I make it and maybe uh, some of us will even be saying that when we get to heaven we'll be saying did I really make it did I really make it you know we may be, may be saying that to ourselves or I was afraid of uh, not getting there on time I'm, am I too late we got there as fast as we could are we too late and the worst one of all from the doctor, did you catch the cancer on time, or is it too late? And that's what's happening here this morning in our text. God's telling these struggling Christians, and he still tells us today, that in spite of what they have done or not done, it's still not too late. They still have time. They still have hope. Let me explain. These people that the Hebrew writer is writing to had been converted to Christ out of Judaism. And as we go through the New Testament, in, in uh, where, where we're at in the New Testament in our studies on Wednesday night and Sunday night, we see that they have struggles with that. They have a struggle with that because uh, they're, they're getting pressure from everywhere. They're getting pressure from... Uh, the Jewish leaders, they didn't like it. So they put the pressure on these converted Christians to abandon that and abandon Christ and go back to their Judaism. And some of them did. But others were, and some were even very tempted to do that. And one of the reasons why they were so tempted to return is because they had become dull of hearing or dull of hearing the word of Christ. And they were still holding on to their Jewish beliefs from the old law instead of growing and maturing in Christ and learning from Him and from His Word, which we should do today. They didn't have the Word then, but... You're in chapter 6 there, so let's, let's start with verse 4 and read through 9. And this is, the, this is the dangers of falling away from Christ. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good words of God and the power of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again. To repent since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to be being cursed, whose end is to be burned. He's letting, them, letting us know in these verses that we can fall away. Now, it'll be a gradual thing. It won't be, uh, you'll just get up one morning and decide, not many people do that. I'm just going to fall away from the church. What it'll be is we'll see less of you, you'll speak to us less, and then eventually you'll be gone. And as a preacher here before you, and as a former elder, I will tell you that even preachers and elders will sit back and say, boy, I wonder where they went, instead of trying to encourage and trying to make sure that we keep them here. But now look at what he says in verse 9. 
But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. It's an extremely serious warning he gave them before this, but now he's letting them know that there's still a chance. You can still make it. You can still change your ways. And he says, though we speak in this manner, the Hebrew writer has just given them a very strong warning of danger of falling away. Even though we are giving you a warning, we are confident of better things concerning you that accompany salvation. In other words, he's saying it's not too late. You haven't gone too far. And what we have to realize is you haven't gone too far unless you've taken that last breath. Once you've taken the last breath of life, there's no hope. But as long as you're here, we still have hope and you still have a chance. They had been converted to Christ. They had been baptized into Christ. But that was about as far as they had come. In fact, some people will be baptized and you'll never see them again. And sometimes what we do is we give them a false sense of security is what happens. That's why they do those things. Well, I'm baptized now, so I'm going to make it to heaven. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to attend church services or come to the studies or try to convert anybody. And they've just went through the motions is what I'm trying to say. In fact, because of the pressure being put on them, they had even more pressure than we had because they were ostracized by the Jewish leaders and they weren't even allowed to trade with them. They, were, they, were, they would refuse trade. Uh, some of them went hungry because of this because they couldn't trade with other people to, to do that. So, but the Hebrew writer says, you haven't gone too far. There's still hope for you. It's not too late. And this hope that he has is still there, uh, grows out of the belief that God is able to reclaim them. We can fall away and we can be reclaimed by God. They had already had the miraculous signs of the apostles. And they had already been taught directly by the apostles. And even though they had seen and heard those things, they had started to fall away. And some were tempted to drift away from Christ. But now the Hebrew writer is convinced that God is able to reclaim them through the message that he is writing to them. And this same thing holds true today for so many who are tempted to go back to the world. They still have a chance. They still have hope. But it's our job to reclaim them, to try to reclaim them. God can reclaim them through the written word if only they will listen, learn, and obey. And as I mentioned before, as long as they still have physical life in their body, as long as they haven't completely hardened themselves against the word of God, there is still hope, and it's not too late. But let me tell you what I often want to do. I often want to just give up on them, and you may want to too. I see someone who has quit coming to church. <clears throat> I see someone who is no longer coming to Bible class or out somewhere doing something they shouldn't be doing or going someplace they shouldn't be going or attending another church. And I say to myself, that's it. I'm done with them. I'm not going to mess with them anymore. But boy, am I glad God doesn't do that with me. And didn't do it with me. The Hebrew writer didn't give up on these people here. And more than that, God didn't either. Look at verse 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And what he's saying there is, for the lack of a better word, I'm giving you credit for the work that you did. I'm giving you an attaboy for that work that you did. But I want you to get back to it. I want you to get back to that work. 
We know we don't earn our salvation, so it's not anything about earning anything or doing anything. But he's giving, he's kind of giving them an attaboy saying, you, you know, I looked at your works. I seen the works you were doing, but now I want you to get back to those works and get back to me. Did you notice that the verse says that God has not forgotten their works in the past, which I was just mentioning. I sometimes just want to say, forget it, forget you. I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to mess with you anymore. And that's what I feel like saying sometimes. But God never says that, ever, with anybody. And we can look at someone, and I know we all have, and we've looked at someone and said, that person will never be converted. Will never be converted. But we can't say that because the power is in God's hands. And we know what his power is. God wants these struggling Christians to get back to Christ and do what they have done in the service to Christ in the past. And keep serving Christ. So that in the end, they'll be saved. In fact, look at verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. And that, was, that may have been related to their past service to God. To the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. These words should encourage us just as much as it encouraged those people that the letter was written to. We are encouraged here to remain faithful to Christ until their life comes to an end because our Lord Jesus Christ was their only and is our only way to salvation. It's the only way we're going to make it. God doesn't look at these struggling Christians and simply say, forget it, I'm done with you. He doesn't do that. And as I said before, I'm glad he didn't do that with me also. God is holding up the promise of eternal salvation and saying, even though you're attempted to drift away, even though you're, you aren't a maturing Christian or you're not in, maturing in Christ, even though you are falling away and turning back to the world, I haven't give up, given up on you. You still have a chance. And it's not all my sermon, it's not too late. And when God makes a promise, we know he keeps it. No matter what it is, good or bad. Because he's promised his people in the Old Testament he would punish them. And he does punish them for not following him. And when God makes a promise, he keeps it. Look, starting in verse 13, the Hebrew writer is going to recall some instances that were well known to the Jews, including these Jewish Christians, to show that God is not only a promise maker, but God is a promise keeper. Look what he says in verse 13. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessed, I will bless you, and multiply you, I will multiply you. This promise comes out of Genesis 12, 3. And what I want to notice here is the word, surely. He made promises to Abraham in, on a few occasions. And he always came through. And what God is saying here, as surely as I am alive, as surely as I exist, I will bless you. And what the Hebrew writer is doing here is he's telling these struggling Christians, as well as all of us, that we can make a, that God makes promises and he keeps them. If he promises salvation to those who are faithful and obedient to Christ, you can count on it. You can count on it. When you get to heaven, you won't have to say, man, I can't believe I made it. You can say to yourself now, I'm going to make it because I'm doing the things that I'm supposed to do. We read about one of the kings in our Old Testament uh, Bible class this morning. And it said about him that he guided his ways in the ways of the Lord. And in the ways of his father David and the fathers before him. And basically that's what we have to do in our life. In Hebrews 6, 15 through 17, it says, Speaking of Abraham, the writer says, And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. 
For men I indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is from them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the, immutably, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. God swore it by himself, and as I mentioned, it was as sure as he lived and as sure as he existed that that promise was going to be kept. There are two unchangeable things about God. One is his promises. The other is the oath that he confirmed that promise with. Hebrews 6.18 That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. And that hope set before us is salvation in Christ. The key point here is it's impossible for God to lie. It's possible for us to lie, but it's not possible for God to lie. When God makes a promise, it's impossible for him to perjure himself or go against what he said. And in Hebrews uh, 6, 19 through 20, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And the veil they're talking about is the veil that separated the people from God in the temple. And Jesus rent that from top to bottom and entered and gave us access to God. We can talk directly to God through our prayers. We can learn directly from God through the word that he's left us. And for these struggling, immature, wavering Christians, and for Christians today who may be struggling, and who have perhaps fallen away, like these Christians had and are slowly drifting away from Christ, and they're going and falling deeper and deeper back into the world. Here is a basic, here is the basic message that God has for you, for all of us too today. It's not too late. You still have a chance. I promise. And that's God making that promise to us. Brother, each one of us must be careful about giving up on someone. I know I've done it and I shouldn't have done it. And I went back and tried to work with them again. They may have seemed to drift away from Christ. They may have seemed to have went back to the worldly life and laid again a foundation of destruction. Instead of doing what we all should do, we should mature in Christ. And we've seen it happen, we've seen it slowly happen, and we've seen it even quickly happen sometimes. I know I have, and I've said sometimes I'm not messing with them again, but we just have to keep going and keep trying. The thing is, just because we give up on them, that doesn't mean God has. And we need to remember that the Word of God has the power to reclaim them no matter what as long as they'll listen and learn and some have come back to Christ also after drifting away <clears throat> Hebrews uh, 10 through 6 10 through 12 for God is not unjust to forget your works and labors of love which you have shown towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister we read that one and we know that what that says is he's giving them credit and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to full assurance of hope until the end. In other words, put your full assurance in God until the end. That you, may, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promise of God. If you're there here this morning and you want to inherit that promise of God... You need to be baptized into Christ. You've already heard the word. You need to confess his name before men, that he is the son of God, and then be baptized. And then the most important thing we need to do is go on to live a faithful life. Or if you're here and you've stumbled in that faithful life and need to be reassured and prayed with, we can do that for you also. Please come as we stand and sing. Have thine affections been damned?